system bytes. Uh, and we've got HMAC at the back. The reason these are variable is because it depends on what ciphers you're actually negotiating, and we'll get that into that in the crypto section. You have the packet length field, which is kind of interesting for a UDP packet because the length field is obvious. It's the size of the packet, except in our case, it's not necessarily because you could pad the packet out with junk at the end. If the packet is padded out with junk at the end, this length is the length that you're paying attention to, not the length of the datagram that came in off the wire. Then we have packet types. Uh, channel IDs, we have UDP channels that run within that allow you to you know, transfer multiple files at the same time and have it be able to sort it out. And then we've got that type specific data, which uh, depends on the type. These are not all of the cutlass packet types. Uh, if you do want all the cutlass packet types, it is documented in the protocol.txt document. Um, but these are probably the keys. We've got uh, the, the most important packet types. We've got key exchange packets, uh, ping pong packets just for liveness checks, uh, connection information packets. So if you want to change your permissions, for example, yes, I accept files, no, I don't accept files. You'll send out information request and response about uh, those kinds of things. Uh, audio packets, and then we've got a reliable transport layer, which is where the text messages and the files go over. Um, connection information packets, it's Capability flags and your nickname. Uh, capability flags are things like can accept audio, can accept files, those kinds of things. The audio, we're using Speaks as a codec uh, behind it. And so it's a really simple sequence number. And then it's, it's the Speaks data. We just pour it in after that. Uh, if you get packets out of sequence, you drop the earlier ones. Because we weren't doing that, and we were getting some really interesting effects. I thought Speaks handled that by itself, but it doesn't. The reliable transport layer is probably the area that we've put the most time into. Uh, I remember reading a rule of programming that said, thou shalt not attempt to replicate TCP's functionality because it's a lot of work. And it is a lot of work, uh, which is why it's where we spent most of our time. Uh, if you've got a transport packet, you have a sub-transport type within that packet. And those are things like initialization, the initialization ACK packet, data send, data request, and channel reset. Um, that's a pretty close analogy to what you've got in TCP without the urge flag in there. But it's not window-based. Um, we'll get into that in a second. Currently, we support three different types of transports. It, it would be really easy to add uh, a fourth transport it, if you wanted. Currently, it's messages and direct requests are memory-backed transports, meaning you write it into a memory buffer. Uh, and then if you do, do a file transfer, it just writes it onto the disk. If you wanted to add a, another thing, you know, something else that used transport, it's really easy. We don't have like a sockets abstraction layer in there, but it would be pretty easy to go through and, and add that type in. Now, I mentioned it's not window-based. It's not, you know, start sending me the data, and when you receive the data, it will fill in from the front of the buffer. We actually have the concept of gaps. Uh, so let's say you have a 4,500 byte gap. Uh, you know, you, you've got a directory request, and it's going to be 4,500 bytes large. What happens is the remote side will actually start advertising, saying, I'm missing bytes 0 through 4,500. Please help me out and fill those in. And so the sending side will then pick frames and we'll send them in. So we've got here byte 0 to 1,000 will show up. Maybe we'll lose a packet. We lose 1,000 to 2,000, and then 2,000 to 3,000 show up. So at this point, you've got two gaps in here. You've got gaps from 1,000 to 2,000 and gaps from 3,000 to 4,500. And so you would advertise that back to the remote side saying, I'm missing these parts. Could you please fill those in? And so it'll fill in 1,000 to 2,000. And um, 4,500, actually, what I just illustrated there was probably an out of sequence arrival. This arrived, that arrived, this arrived out of sequence. When you advertise a new gap, the number of gaps increases, it will actually switch ends to allow any out of sequence packets to show up. And so it will start writing in from the back end. So at that point, we only have one gap left, 3,500 to 4,000, and that gets filled in. So we can actually do some, uh, well, here are the rate limiting uh, rules that we've got right now. Uh, if you get a request in for a gap, you immediately send a response out with some data in response to that gap. If we get a successful request response pair, meaning we've got a request, a new request that came in without an increase in the number of gaps, uh, and the actual amount of data that his requesting has shrunk, it'll increase the, the rate by one packet per second. 
um, so we can spin up faster if we've got a fast connection. Um, and so we'll periodically send packets that aren't, we didn't get a request for that, we'll continue writing off the end because we assume that it's still getting there. So we don't need to have an ACK for each pack. We're not latency bound by that, which would be really stupid. Um, if the number of gaps increases, if we get fragments, something has arrived out of order or we dropped a packet, drop the unsolicited packet rate. Uh, and that is our, our back off so that we're not slamming the channel. Uh, some stats that we've got, and this is over uh, a local uh, link. Um, uh, SCP takes 45 seconds to copy a 34 megabyte file. It took Cutlass 53 seconds. So we're in the ballpark of, of TCP, which we haven't done that much tuning yet, so I'm not surprised that we're not being quite as fast. We're also a little bit slower to spin up than TCP currently, uh, and we're, we're quicker to fall back. So if um, we were doing simultaneous connections, we were actually using 75% of the bandwidth, SCP was eating it, and Cutlass stabilized at about 25% of the bandwidth. So we're a little less aggressive than TCP, which is probably a good thing because we don't want to gain a reputation as a horrific protocol that will eat all your bandwidth and nothing else will work. And when you're trying to play in the same space as TCP is, that's, that's pretty important. <clears throat> now, because we're this UDP-based protocol, we've got some advantages that TCP doesn't normally have. Um, we're unrestricted by window size, so you don't have. So, if on a very high latency link, you know, if they ever get the interplanetary internet running, uh, we wouldn't have to worry necessarily about oh, we can only write out to the window size in terms of bytes, and then we've got to wait for at least some of that data to get acknowledged. We can continue writing uh, out there. We're only going to write slowly. It will be a slow spin up, but but we would continue writing and we would be able to send those unsolicited packets and fill the pipe that way. The the key advantage here is that it's easy to turn into arbitrary BitTorrent chunks. Currently, you know, BitTorrent picks a block size, for example, one megabyte, and then it will go out and ask for one megabyte chunks from various and sundry people. With this, because we're advertising gaps and the gaps are in bytes, we can ask for arbitrary byte ranges from multiple people. So we could get multiple transfers going and as gaps fill in from those other people, we can advertise different gaps to, to all those transfers simultaneously. Uh, if we just maintain state about what gaps are in our files, we have no losses whatsoever and it would be really easy to, to start from a halted transfer again. Um, and the unrestricted by window size would give us the, the high latency performance, but we haven't actually tested that yet, so take that with a huge grain of salt. Theoretically, it should work, I think. Are there any questions about the protocols or transport layer that we've created? All right, well, Jack is our crypto master, so I'm gonna turn it over to him for the crypto. So uh, we were you know, starting out this project and we realized that we were going to have to develop our own UDP based crypto uh, so we you know sat down and decided to take some time go over what attackers we were concerned with and how we were going to stop them and then I'll give a overview of the handshaking protocol itself uh, Todd showed you earlier the uh, packet layout these sections and it's somewhat confusing because the shaded out areas are the actual unencrypted going in the clear. Everything else that you see here is uh, encrypted and hopefully not visible to anyone sniffing on the wire. Uh, some potential attackers, there's probably others, but you know, ISPs sometimes get curious. Board mail admins, etc. Cops, competitors, any, you know, various and sundry TLAs. You gotta watch out for KFC, man. I mean, that, you look at that kernel. You can't trust that guy. Uh, some of the many possible attacks, but these are the ones that we have included kind of explicit countermeasures for. Um, key recovery, just any sort of attack, say stealing your machine and just grabbing it there, or uh, anything of that nature. Man in the middle attacks or active attacks in general. Uh, replaying pla packets, uh, modifying them, inj trying to inject new ones, uh, things like that. Traffic analysis, just looking at 
everything that's out there and direct code analysis. Some of the many ways to recover keys. Um, the RIP Act, I don't know. I don't suppose anyone here is from the UK, but okay, well then you're all safe unless you visit the UK. But uh, the RIP Act, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a law in the UK that says if the government wants, you will hand over your keys or you'll go to jail. And if you disclose that your keys were taken by the government, you get an extra five years tacked on your sentence. So, good fun. There's two main features in the Cullis crypto protocol to help at least mitigate these attacks. Um, the private keys, as you saw in the demo, are protected with passwords. So if you choose a good one, you know, if someone just steals your laptop, maybe they won't be able to get the key. I, I should point out that in the interest of usability, we've made the passwords optional. There's a warning box that says, you know, do you really want to be a fool and not protect your key with a password? But it, it, it is optional. And actually, probably one of the most important features in the protocol is the Infral Diffie Hellman key exchange because, uh, I mean, I'll go over the details later, but essentially we do a key exchange with keys that we generate just for that transaction. We generate a key and then we throw them away. So even if someone is to compromise your long-term keys, they won't be able to read a past conversation. They'd only be able to read future ones that you made encrypted using that key. Hmm. Mostly readable. Um, some potential ways to do man in the middle or more active attacks. They're not trivial. I mean, it would seem to be difficult to do active attacks on every single SSL you know, transaction being done all over the world. So it's going to be more of a targeted per user or per group sort of, you know, we're interested in these people or, you know, someone trying to mess with you specifically rather than just doing it for fun. Um, actually, Todd, do you want to do the talk about center track? Because that okay, was a pretty sure, interesting story. Sure. Um, I, I, I used to work at UUNet, uh, and one of the things that we had running in there was a project called center track. And the idea was, um, it was, it was to, for denial of service mitigation. The idea was that you could propagate a route out for one specific uh, IP address that actually went to a GRE tunnel that would go down to the UUNet lab. And you could then analyze all the packets going to that one particular IP address, and they'd all be coming through your one router. If they came in on any gateway in your network, they'd all end up going to this one router in your lab. You could slice them, dice them, you know, do what you want before you then e push them out to the you know, exit gateway on that side, which went down to the customer. Um, and that was for denial of service mitigation. Uh, the idea was that if someone was getting flooded, you'd set up a center track tunnel, send it down to your lab, be able to figure out what kinds of things were happening in the packets, is there anything we could filter on specifically, and then put those filters in place. So when you hear people say that, oh, it's not really possible to track all traffic on the internet, we weren't getting all traffic on the internet, we were just getting all traffic through UUNet to one IP, but that's a good chunk of the internet that would be talking to that one IP. So the technologies, and there, there are public papers on this you can go read about if you do just a Google search on CenterTrack. Uh, it is possible to route uh, you know, individual IPs of interest through central locations. Um, at the time you could detect it via traceroute and they were working on how to av have that avoid showing up. but. Conspiracy theories about yes. um, countermeasures to a man in the middle attack. We do more or less the SSH style. Presumably, you've all used SSH, where you know you connect to a machine. If you've already got that key, then great, you have already known somehow who this person is. And if you've never talked to them before, uh, then just accept whatever key uh, that you're given, which is vulnerable to a man in the middle attack. Someone can splice a new key in at that point, but they can only do it once, presuming you keep the key around. Um, the audio component provides a fairly easy way of verifying keys. You know, we're already talking, I know your voice, we can exchange key fingerprints over that. And it would be possible, but it seems a little difficult for someone to do a man-in-the-middle attack, then replicate your voice. Uh, possible, but... Um, this actually should have been in anti-goals. Yeah, it's true. But 
were not interested in a 